do 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 In August this year, one of the greatest arcade racers known to mankind, Daytona USA, turns 25 years old. So let's look at the phenomenon that was Daytona USA in the arcade. We'll look at its home ports, its sequels and its legacy, as we celebrate 25 years of Daytona USA. Please choose manual. Manual. Gentlemen, start your engines. Daytona USA is an arcade racing game that was produced by Sega AM2 that saw a limited release in Japanese arcades in 1993, followed shortly after this by a worldwide release in April 1994. It was the first game to utilise Sega's brand new Model 2 arcade board, and at the time its sleek, texture map polygon graphics that ran at a blistering 60 frames per second were unlike anything that had been seen in the arcade before. Because at this particular time in the early 1990s, the transition from sprite-based 2D to fully 3D polygon-based arcade games was still a relatively new thing. And my first real taste of a 3D polygon arcade racing title before Daytona USA came in 1992 in the form of Virtua Racing, a game also produced by Sega, which came out on the Model 1 arcade board. The predecessor, as I'm sure you've been able to work out yourself from the name, of the Model 2 arcade board. And one of the greatest innovations in moving away from sprite based 2D graphics to 3D polygon graphics is the ability to choose what viewpoint you actually want to play the game in. And Virtua Racing very handily named them all. So you've got the fly mode, the furthest one away from the car, the float mode moving in a bit closer, follow mode which looks more like your traditional 2D arcade racing games, and finally the cockpit view. And this innovation was something that was carried across into Daytona USA as well. And the ability to choose what view you want to play in is something which has pretty much become a staple of all modern driving games now. And as revolutionary and amazing looking as Virtua Racing looked at the time, there's no doubt that simply adding these textures to the flat polygons of Daytona USA really does make the game look so much better. Although ironically, I have seen it mentioned that apparently Daytona USA has actually got a lower polygon count than Virtua Racing, so it's actually not having to do quite as much on screen as Virtua Racing is, in terms of the amount of squares and triangles it's moving around or something. Can you tell that I'm not really all that bothered about the technical details? But fancy graphics weren't the only thing that Daytona USA had going for it. It also had the most important thing of all. It was bloody good fun to play! The game is made up of three different stages, each of which represents a different difficulty level. The beginner stage, 3-7 speedway. The advanced stage, Dinosaur Canyon. And the expert stage, Sea Side Street Galaxy. And in true Sega Racer style, the game is easy to pick up and play, but difficult to truly master. The game came in a variety of sit-down cabinet types, although I can't recall ever seeing any stand-up ones, and my first ever experience playing it was in a massive 8-player setup, very similar to the one on screen here. And chuffin' heck, this game really was great fun if you were playing it with a big group of mates. 
Even just playing the multiplayer with a group of complete strangers was brilliant fun, as you'd see the look of frustration as you successfully managed to slam an opponent's car into the sonic wall and laugh maniacally to yourself as they flip out uncontrollably. <laughs> But despite the very fun, pick up and play nature of Daytona USA, if you look a bit more in depth at the game, under the hood so to speak, see what I did there, you'll find the throbbing engine of an arcade racing game, with a surprising amount of depth built into its play mechanics. And yes, I realise that throbbing engine does indeed sound innuendo-tastic, but hey, what are you going to do? And the nuances in these gameplay mechanics begin to become apparent when players graduate from automatic transmission to manual gears, with players who opt to use manual gears not only gaining a speed advantage over their human opponents, but also being able to use the gears to initiate a gear drift, where you fly around a corner at much greater speeds than you would if you were braking. Most pro players will tend to do it with a 4-2-4 drifting method. Well, I must admit, I tend to find it a little bit easier doing a 4-1-3-4 method to get round the corner. It just seems to be a little bit easier to control. Another advanced technique in the game was the rocket start, achieved by keeping the foot on the accelerator just enough to keep the tachometer between 6 and 7 RPMs, whilst keeping the brake firmly depressed. As soon as the starting grid turns green, release the brake and then fully depress the accelerator to achieve the rocket start. It's often easier said than done. As well as the regular arcade mode, the game also featured a time attack mode, accessible by pressing the start button down when you were selecting the stage you wanted to play on. This gave you free reign on the track with none of those pesky CPU cars to get in the way and interfere with your all important lap times. Interestingly, whilst we're on the subject of the CPU cars, the game will analyse how well you're doing on your first lap. If you're playing poorly, the CPU cars will move out of the way more for you as you're playing. If you're playing well, they'll be right obstructive pricks and get right in your way. The game also featured a few quirky little secrets as well. In both normal arcade and time attack mode, it's possible to turn the car around and start playing the track in reverse. Once you go through your first reverse checkpoint, your time will get extended and your lap times will start registering. On 3.7 Speedway you can actually take a shortcut through the pit lane if you manage to keep your wheels just on the side of the verge as you're going through it which actually stops the car from pitting in. This is a technique you'll see top players doing when they're trying to get super fast lap times. It's quite an advanced technique and to be honest I find it hard enough just trying to get it to work one time let alone trying to do it eight times in a row. Because if your position's slightly out you'll end up pitting in and undoing all that good work that you just did. Like I've just done here. In a regular race, there isn't really any advantage to pitting in. It repairs any cosmetic damage to the car, but in the regular arcade mode, this cosmetic damage doesn't make any difference to the performance of the car. However, arcade operators had the option to change the game into a special Grand Prix or Endurance mode, in which you'd get much longer races. And I mean much longer. The beginner stage alone needs 80 laps to complete in Endurance mode. Flippin' heck. The arcade operator could also turn on a handicap mode in the game, and with that activated, players racing in Grand Prix or Endurance mode will start getting tyre wear, which means that pitting in is essential. In the regular arcade mode, the no handicap option is normally activated by default, and the effect this has is to increase the top speed of all the players that aren't in first place, in order to try and keep the matches a little bit closer and fast paced. It's possible to turn the handicap mode off at the course selection screen, by keeping all four of the view select buttons pressed down when you're selecting your course. If more than half the players in the multiplayer game choose to do that, then the speed boost will be disabled. On the beginner stage, you can actually stop the bars on the giant slot machine as you drive round by pressing the start button. The bars move from left to right, and each press of the start button will stop them in turn. If you manage to get three sevens in a row, you get a time bonus. If you manage to get three bars in a row, you get a slightly smaller time bonus. Oh, nearly had it, but not quite. On Dinosaur Canyon, there was a secret little bit of extra track that led off backwards from the pit lane. If you went up it and into the little alcove at the back, 
there was an interesting message for you. And finally, on the Sea Side Street Galaxy stage, if you stop by the statue of Jeffrey from Virtua Fighter, and then continue to press the start button, you could make him dance around. Now legend has it that as well as the four standard views that are available in the game, there's also a secret fifth aerial one, which views the car from above, which is supposedly accessible by pressing the start, two, three and four VR buttons together. But I've never managed to get it to work. And the only video evidence of this that I can find online is by someone who actually says in their video description that they weren't able to get this working with the buttons either and resorted to a bit of hackery. They also go on to state that in this mode, if you go into the pit lane, it causes the game to crash. So this makes me wonder if this secret view is just a bit of an urban myth and was more likely to be a feature that the developers used which was then subsequently left on the cutting room floor and then later discovered by people who were able to hack into the game's ROM. I could be completely wrong about this though, so let me know if you have managed to access this secret view in the arcade machine without any hackery. Now it would be impossible to do a retrospective of Daytona USA without talking about the actual vehicle that the player controls when they're playing the game. Because in some respects, the cars become almost as iconic as the actual game itself. Car number 41, the Hornet High Class. It's a stock car that was loosely based on a Chevrolet Beretta. The number 41 is the game's producer Toshihiro Nagoshi's lucky number. Seems like a bit of an oddly specific lucky number to me, but hey, what do I know, I'm not a genius Japanese games producer. <coughs> Toshihiro-san apparently came up with the idea for Daytona USA, following a trip to a NASCAR track whilst he was visiting North America. He was inspired by the fast and frenetic action that he saw on the track, and wanted to try and create an arcade experience that would capture this excitement. And thus, Daytona USA came to be. The arcade version of Daytona USA was critically lauded when it first came out, and even today it'll still place highly in lists of the best arcade games ever and the most influential driving games of all time. Unlike any successful arcade title from back in the day, it inevitably ended up with its fair share of home conversions and sequels, and in the video I plan to cover every single one of these. Now I'm going to try and do this mainly with video capture footage that I've obtained myself of me actually playing these games, but already I can think of a couple of instances where this isn't going to be possible. So for any footage I use that isn't something I've captured myself, I will put the name of the uploader and the name of the video on screen, and also add a link to it in the video description as well. So without further ado, let's move on to our first home port of Daytona USA, which was for the Sega Saturn in 1995. Released in 1995, the Sega Saturn version of Daytona USA was in fact a launch title for the console, and like the console itself it was unfortunately rush released, and as such it did not utilise the full power of the Saturn. The game ran at a dismal 20 frames per second, and also had a very poor draw distance, which meant that scenery tended to just pop up out of nowhere when you were racing around the courses. And if that wasn't enough, the PAL version of the game had great big ugly black borders at the top and bottom of the screen as well. And as well as looking crap, the Saturn version of Daytona was also missing another vital component from the arcade machine. There was no two-player split-screen option, a feature which even the humble Sega Mega Drive version of Virtua Racing had managed to include in the game. Now I've mentioned before in one of my other videos about Sega arcade racing games that I think that the fact that the Saturn version of Daytona USA looked like such complete and utter shite is one of the things which actually had a negative impact on the sales of the machine when it very first came out. The Saturn launched over here in the UK for an exorbitant £399. Now if you think that that doesn't sound too bad, remember that this is 1995 that we're talking about. So just because I can, I've used an inflation calculator to work out what that would be in today's money, 
almost £630, which is considerably higher than the average launch price of a contemporary console. So the point I'm trying to make here is that the Saturn wasn't cheap when it came out, it was an expensive console, and this is the game that they were hoping would encourage people to buy it. A home port that looked like an incredibly poor relation of the arcade machine, that lacked any multiplayer modes to boot. Now later on in the same year, the Saturn received a port as Sega Rally, which seemed to fix all of these problems. It ran at a far more impressive 30 frames per second. The draw distance was greatly improved, with far less pop-up going on as you played the game. And if that wasn't enough, they'd managed to squeeze a two-player split-screen mode in as well. Sadly though, first impressions came, and unfortunately for the Saturn, a lot of those first impressions would have been based on the suboptimal port of Daytona USA that came out on the system when it was first released. Particularly as Daytona USA tended to be used as a demonstration game in game shops to demonstrate the alleged capabilities of this brand new 32-bit machine. I think it's really no wonder that so many people flocked over to the PS1, especially considering it was £100 cheaper than the Saturn. And I do often wonder to myself how much of a difference it would have made to the Saturn's fortunes if the launch version of Daytona had looked like this, instead of the rush-released crap version that they ended up with. Now, being the loyal Sega fanboy that I was back then, I did eventually end up picking up a Saturn, but I didn't get mine until 1996, and I also managed to get it second-hand, which meant it only cost £90. Now what's interesting about the fact that I picked up the Saturn a little bit later in its life cycle is that around this time, there were a lot of rumours doing the rounds in the UK Sega Saturn magazines that suggested that Sega were planning on bringing out a new remastered version of Daytona USA for the Saturn, which would correct a lot of the flaws of the original conversion, and that this new version was being created by the same team that did Sega Rally on the Saturn. Now owing to this fact, despite being a massive fan of Daytona USA back then, I never actually owned the original version on the Saturn, and my only experiences of playing it have come through modern day emulation, which is what I'm playing it on here, using an emulator called SSF. Now despite all the visual drawbacks of the Saturn version, a lot of the Daytona purists out there will argue that underneath all this, you still do have the basic bare bones of the Daytona USA gameplay, translated to a home system fairly intact. And I think I can sort of see where they're coming from. I'm playing the game here with digital control, so obviously the steering feels very different to the arcade machine, but I have also got the gear set up to individual buttons, which means that I can go from first to third to fourth, literally as I said, at the press of a button, which means initiating the gear drift does feel sort of similar to the way that it does when I'm playing this with a pad in modern versions of Daytona USA. The game was also compatible with the Sega Saturn racing wheel and 3D analog pad, so it would be interesting to see just how much closer to the arcade version it feels with those peripherals, rather than the digital controls that I'm restricted to here. The game did have some additional features that weren't in the arcade mode, such as the ability to play a couple of bonus cars, which were palette swapped versions of the original with slightly different stats. There was also the bizarre ability to play as a horse in the game as well, with a different colour representing manual and automatic gears. The game also featured a karaoke mode, in case you had an overwhelming desire to sing along to the song's lyrics whilst you were playing. There was also an option to race on reversed versions of the tracks, allowing you to play them in a mirror mode. Along with secret codes that you could enter, in the name entry screen at the end of a race, which would allow you to hear small excerpts of music from previous Sega games. The Saturn version of Daytona USA was ported to Windows PCs in 1996, and according to the website SegaRetro.org, it offers only limited improvements over its console counterpart, with frame rate, draw distance and camera transitions being very similar between the two versions. SegaRetro.org also go on to mention that in Japan there were two different versions of the game, owing to the changing nature of the PC market over there at the time. So let's move on now to our next version of Daytona USA, which is also for the Sega Saturn, and this is that rumoured improved version that I'd first heard about back in 1996 when I first bought my Sega Saturn, a version of the game which would go on to be called Daytona USA Championship Circuit Edition.
Now, although I do still own a Sega Saturn, in truth, I actually sold my copy of this game about 10 years ago. So I'm using SSF emulator to play it on here. And unlike the first game, SSF doesn't quite manage to emulate Daytona USA Championship perfectly. You've probably already noticed there's a bit of a strange flickery effect going on with the 2D graphics in the background. Despite the imperfect emulation though, I think the improvements in the graphics are instantly apparent, with the game now running at a greatly improved 30 frames a second, and also getting rid of those black borders at the top and bottom of the screen that were in the PAL version. Improved graphics weren't the only change to the game though. The game now also featured a selection of different cars and also two brand new tracks, National Park Speedway and Desert City. Let's have a quick look at them both now. I love all the little touches in these tracks, like the train going round here in Desert City, and the roller coaster and the big wheel in the National Park, and the hot air balloon there as well. These are all just really nice little touches that are really reminiscent of Sega of old. And the attention to detail they used to like to put into their games, just to make them feel that little bit extra special. One of the other great things as well about the Saturn version of Daytona USA Championship Circuit Edition is the fact that not only did it provide all this extra content compared to the original game, but they also managed to squeeze a split screen two player mode in there as well. Now one of the curious things about this game is the fact that it was handled by Sega AM3 rather than Sega AM2, and Sega AM3 were the guys who'd made the Saturn's port of Sega Rally. And by all the kings, Daytona USA Championship Circuit Edition, that's a real mouthful to have to keep saying that, I'm just going to call it CCE from now on, was also based around the same game engine that they'd used for the Saturn version of Sega Rally, which led to complaints from some players that the game now no longer felt like Daytona USA. Now, whilst I could see that this would be a source of frustration for some people, I have to admit that this didn't bother me at all back in the 90s when I actually owned the game. Because in all honesty back then, I used to only ever play the arcade machine on the beginner stage, and to me this felt like a close enough approximation of it just being played with my regular Saturn pad. Just like the first version of Daytona USA on the Saturn, CCE also had support for the arcade racer wheel and the Saturn's 3D control pad, something which I probably could have done with here judging by the shit driving on display. The two unlockable horses from the first game also make a reappearance here and something which the more eagle-eyed amongst you may have noticed already. The original Hornet was not amongst the initial selection of cars that you could choose, only becoming available once you'd managed to get first place in all the tracks on the normal difficulty. The initial selection of cars have all got different strengths and weaknesses, with some having a much greater emphasis on grip and acceleration, and others having more of an emphasis on maximum speed. Unlike the regular selectable cars though, once you unlock the Hornet, it has five stars in everything, grip, acceleration and speed. Now, I don't have the Hornet unlocked in this emulated version of CCE that I'm playing here, but I have previously unlocked it in the 1997 PC port of Daytona USA Championship Edition, which was called Daytona USA Deluxe. And one of the things that's interesting about Daytona USA Deluxe is that on top of the Saturn's two new tracks, it had an additional third one, 
called Silver Ocean Causeway. So let's have a look at this PC exclusive track, together with this secret unlockable version of the Hornet racing on it. Although I keep referring to this car as the Hornet, technically its real name is Daytona, as there is already a version of the Hornet in CCE and Daytona USA Deluxe. And with its 5 star maxed out stats, it doesn't really handle anything like the Hornet from the original arcade game. It's a bit like when I used to play Street Fighter Alpha 2 on my Saturn using Shinakuma, and you just breeze through all the other opponents. Another brilliant Saturn game by the way. So as well as the extra track, we can see that Daytona USA Deluxe offers higher resolution gameplay than its Saturn counterpart, along with clearer 2D graphics like the HUD, and also an improved draw distance as well. Since the game was initially released, it's received a direct 3D patch, which adds in texture filtering and also a fogging effect which is trying to hide geometry pop-in. And you can see that effect working in the gameplay here. I think it sort of works, but you do still notice the pop-in though but I think this does help give the game just a little bit more of a graphical edge over CCE on Saturn. And as well as having better graphics and an extra track, Daytona USA Deluxe also supported an 8 player network, a feature of the game I've never tried myself. Daytona USA Deluxe also added in some additional options to change the game's handling and suspension, apart from the handling which I normally like to make just a little bit less sensitive if I'm using the game's analogue controls, I don't really tend to bother fiddling with any of the other options. Another quirky new feature of Daytona USA Deluxe was the ability to choose what time of day you raced at, with the game giving you an additional 5 options to choose on top of the regular daytime mode. The effect is quite variable in how it works, with some of the settings, like the twilight one here, actually looking quite interesting. But others, like the midnight setting, just making it look like your PC monitor's broken. Now one of the other features of Daytona USA that we haven't talked about so far is its soundtrack. The soundtrack was composed and performed by Takanobu Mitsuyoshi, who came up with the novel idea of giving the game proper songs, which he sang the lyrics to. So whilst contemporary driving games at the time, such as the Ridge Racer series, were going for more of a techno feel with thumping bass and banging rave tunes, Mitsuyoshi created sunny pop tunes with memorable lyrics about flying sky high and... I think that regardless of whether you think these tunes are a load of cheesy nonsense, or that they're heavenly sonnets right up there with the best works of Beethoven and Mozart, there's no doubt in my mind that they're definitely a factor that's helped contribute to the game's iconic status. When it came to Championship Circuit Edition though, Sega brought in Richard Jacks and June Sinu to produce a new remix soundtrack. Jun Sinui, I'm sure I'm probably pronouncing his name wrong, is a veteran Sega music composer, with an impressively vast back catalogue of Sega games under his belt that he is responsible for doing the music for, with his specialty being electric guitar. He's also a member of the band Crush 40. He composed the game's introductory song, Sons of Angels. The vocals were performed by 80s rock supremo Eric Martin, who was the lead singer of the band, Mr. Big. I can't say I'm particularly familiar with any of their work, but then I was more of a raver than a rocker back then. I still am. I do like Sons of Angels a lot though, and I do think it is a really good way of actually introducing the game.
Richard Jacks is a name that you'll probably be familiar with if you played any of the Sonic and All-Star racing games that came out last generation. With Sonic and All-Star Transformed being a particular musical highlight for me, with some really, really excellent dancey remixes of classic Sega theme tunes, and some particularly good drum and bass ones as well, Richard Jacks has got an equally impressive vast back catalogue of games that he's worked on. And if you're old like me, you probably first encountered his work back in the Sega Saturn days, with Sonic R being my first introduction to his work. Another old game with an absolutely outstanding soundtrack, which despite being a little bit on the cheesy side, I still often find myself going back to for a listen from time to time. Particularly when I've just staggered home from the pub on a Friday night after about 10 pints, and I need a little bit of Euro cheese in my life before I go to bed. But anyway, that's enough about my post-pub Friday night antics. Let's talk a bit more about this game. So I'd mentioned earlier in the video that Daytona USA Deluxe had the ability to support an 8 player network, but something I only found out about myself a few years ago was that in North America there was a special Saturn version of CCE that came out that supported a network. And this came as a complete surprise to me, because as a European owner of a Sega Saturn, I never even knew back then that the Saturn had any online functionality because the Saturn Netlink modem only ever came out in North America. Now, as someone that was suitably impressed when the Sega Dreamcast came out with an online function, I have to say that this is pretty mind-blowing to think that the Sega Saturn actually had this back in the mid-1990s. I mean, this is incredible. Now, something else that's incredible about this game is the amount of money that it goes for these days. So again, according to our friends over at SegaRetro.org, this version of the game is widely believed to be the rarest North American Sega Saturn game, with an eBay sighting recently going for $1,100. Well, fuck me sideways, that is an awful lot of money. Japanese Sega Saturn players wouldn't get a copy of this game until 1997. The game dropped the championship title from its name and became simply Circuit Edition. It's much the same game as CCE. Although AM3 had continued to work on the project and made some minor improvements in areas such as draw distance and texture quality, as well as offering more gameplay and music options, giving players the option to choose the original arcade versions of the songs, as well as the remix tunes. Like Daytona USA Deluxe, there was now an option to choose what time of day you wanted to play your chosen stage at. New drift mechanics had also been implemented to enable the game to control more similarly to the arcade version. The game also supported the Sega Saturn modem for online play, Japan's equivalent to the Netlink internet modem that they had in North America. What happened to us in Europe, Sega? How come we never got a modem? Now another Daytona USA oddity, and something else which I've only just become aware of fairly recently, is Daytona USA Deluxe Special Edition. Now whilst it sounds like a complete game, Daytona USA Deluxe Special Edition is actually a demo version of Daytona USA Deluxe for the PC, modified to include the Skittles Racing Team brand. And much like the Netlink version of Daytona USA CCE, copies of this have been spotted on eBay for very inflated prices. As a demo version of the game, the only car that's playable is the CCE version of the Hornet, replete with a new Skittles themed paint job. The other thing which you can't have failed to notice is the frigging Great Big Rainbow which now stretches across Dinosaur Canyon. A graphical effect that's so saccharine, it's rumoured to have been responsible for many cases of childhood diabetes in North America. Well I think we've pretty comprehensively covered Daytona USA Championship Circuit Edition now. Let's move on to our next home port of the game. But before we do, let's just have a quick comparison between the original Saturn version of Daytona USA and CCE, both run on the same emulator that I've been using all along, SSF. Daytona USA 2001 
was a 2000 release for the Sega Dreamcast. Co-released by Sega, Hasbro and Infograms, as Sega no longer held on to the license for the Daytona brand. The game was an update to the original 1993 title, and as well as including brand new fancy graphics, which were now arguably better than the Model 2 originals, the game also boasted a whole load of new cars to play as, some of which were immediately available, others required unlocking by meeting certain conditions in-game, and also a whole load of new tracks to play on as well. So as well as the original three arcade Daytona USA tracks, it also included new and visually improved versions of the two tracks from Daytona USA CCE that came out on the Saturn. On top of these five tracks, with three brand new tracks, I'm going to let the game introduce them. So let's have a quick look now at all of these new tracks and new cars in action.
checkpoint. Your time extended. Two months to go. Stay low in the turn. Rear bump. Checkpoint. On top of all this, the game also offered an option to play on all the stages at sunset and included a huge amount of new original and remixed music from the game. The game also featured a two player split screen mode, which managed to maintain a rock steady 60 frames per second, even with two screens worth of action going on. So in many ways this sounds like it should be the absolute perfect version of Daytona USA. It's arguably got better graphics than the original arcade game, it's got tons of extra cars and music, not to mention five brand new stages, as well as a whole host of customization options. But despite all the daytona -y goodness on offer here, there was unfortunately one big problem with this game. And that problem was that the controls were just too flippin' sensitive if you were trying to play it with a pad. Now, I've mentioned the story of how I came by my copy of Daytona USA 2001 for the Dreamcast before, in another one of my videos, so you'll have to forgive me if I'm repeating myself here, but there is a bit of context to this. So I picked up my copy of Daytona USA for the Dreamcast when I was on holiday in Thailand back in 2001, a market seller in Bangkok was selling Dreamcast games for ridiculously cheap prices, the equivalent of just like a couple of beers over there. The games themselves were obviously bootleg, but as the price was so cheap I decided to take a gamble and see if they'd work on my UK Dreamcast when I got home. I thought at worst, what's happened is I bought a novelty Daytona USA looking drinks coaster. To my utter amazement, when I got home not only did the game work, it turned out to be a Japanese version of the game that worked absolutely fine on my English Dreamcast. And the reason that I mention this is because when the game eventually got a Western release, it had additional options added to it that let you tweak the sensitivity of the car's handling. And as it was, the Japanese version that I had was practically unplayable with a pad. With the handling of the car being so sensitive, it was very easy to oversteer and then end up skidding and fishtailing all over the place. In a bid to try and improve things I even ended up buying one of these McLaren racing wheels for the Dreamcast, but unfortunately it didn't really seem to make any difference. The handling still just felt off and not like the arcade. It wasn't until many years later when I tried the Dreamcast emulator Demule on my PC and I played Daytona USA 2001 using my racing wheel that I really truly began to appreciate the game. And in fact using the PC steering wheel, the game handles so well it's possible to keep it perfectly in sync with the proper arcade version of Daytona USA. In North America, the 2001 title was dropped from the game and it went back to being just Daytona USA. 
There was something else that was different about the North American and Japanese versions of Daytona USA 2001 were the fact that they both had network play for up to four players online, but for some reason this feature was removed from the PAL version. Now, I never actually tried getting online with the Japanese version of the game that I had, because I just assumed that the dial-up modem would be trying to contact a local number over there, and would therefore just never connect, seeing as I was ringing from the UK. My only experience of playing the Dreamcast online back in the day was on the puzzle game Choo Choo Rocket, which wasn't exactly very graphically demanding, but despite this though, the gameplay was still very laggy, just using the Dreamcast built-in dial-up modem. So if you're a gamer from the US or Japan, or any of the other regions that supported network play for Daytona USA 2001, I'd be interested in knowing what your online experiences were like with this game, and just how well it played using a dial-up modem. The game was the brainchild of Toshihiro Nagoshi. And another thing that's curious about the game is why they decided to release Daytona USA for the Dreamcast, when there was a certain other Toshihiro Nagoshi arcade game that had been doing the rounds in the arcades round about this time, that might possibly have been a better fit for the Dreamcast. Now, I suspect you're probably all ahead of me here in guessing what that game is, but we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Now, I think that pretty effectively wraps up Daytona USA 2001. The next home port which I played after this was for the PlayStation 3. But before that, though, I want to talk about something else that happened in between then. A little something called Model 2 Emulator. Now, I very first got into emulators about 10 years ago, and the very first emulator I ever got working on my PC was MAME, and the very first game I ever played on it was R-Type 2, which you can see running in the background here. And I'll let you in on a little secret here. The first time I got this game running, it absolutely blew my mind. Now, those of you brought up on modern games with expensive cinematic intros and photorealistic 3D graphics, I'm probably wondering just what I found so incredible about getting this old 2D shooter up working on my PC. But the thing that absolutely blew my mind was the fact that this was an actual arcade game running on my home computer. And it wasn't long after I'd tracked down copies of pretty much every single one of my favourite 2D arcade games that I found out that there was a specific emulator for Model 2 arcade games, and the thought that I could possibly get the actual arcade version of Daytona USA running on my PC blew my mind even more. Getting hold of a copy of the emulator was pretty straightforward, but trying to find a working Daytona USA ROM turned out to be quite a headache for some reason. All the versions of the game I was finding at your usual dodgy ROM sharing sites all seemed to be missing files and just didn't want to work. Eventually though, I did manage to find a copy from a source that at the time I used to associate more with movies and music. A torrent sharing site whose name you can work out by taking this gentleman's profession and then combining it with this gentleman's surname. So having now finally got my hands on a working ROM, I loaded the game up for the first time, and this is what it looked like on my old Pentium 4 processor PC. Having finally got the game working, it turned out my bloody PC wasn't powerful enough to play it. The frame rate was choppy as hell, and you probably noticed all that stuttery audio right at the start of the game. On top of which, the game wasn't really playable properly using a PC joypad, because the x-axis sensitivity was just so high, as it was configured for the much larger range of movement of an arcade steering wheel, rather than the much smaller x-axis of a thumbstick on a joypad. Now, you might be wondering why I'm going into so much detail about my own personal experiences with this emulator. And the reason for that is, as a big Daytona USA fan, I want to highlight the lengths and the expense that I was prepared to go to back then to get this game working properly on my PC. And it quickly began to dawn on me that the only way I was going to get that to happen was by improving my PC hardware. And as an absolute home computer novice back then, the thought of taking the side off my PC and fiddling around with the hardware inside it filled me with absolute terror at the thought of accidentally breaking something, all for the sake of an arcade game. I started off by buying an extra gigabyte of RAM for the Pentium 4, taking it up to its full capacity of 2 gigabytes, but to be honest that did absolutely nothing. The next step was to upgrade my graphics card, again another nightmare for a computer novice like me, as I was trying to figure out if I had an AGP or a PCI slot, and whether my power supply unit would be up to the challenge of actually giving this thing enough juice in the first place. 
In many ways, buying this card really was an expensive leap of faith, because I had no idea whether this would actually work or not. Eventually the card arrived in the post. I installed it, kept my fingers crossed, fired up the game for the first time, and... I had the motherfucking arcade version of Daytona USA working on my PC at full speed! Boom! <laughs> now, admittedly, I still couldn't play the game properly with a joypad, but this was a major hurdle that I'd cleared. The Model 2 emulator didn't just replicate the arcade game's graphics, it actually enhanced them. Later versions of the emulator allowed you to play the game in HD resolutions, and also added in an optional widescreen mode. It wasn't until some time later that I eventually got the controls sorted, when a random visit to a game shop before a trip to the cinema ended up with me coming home with one of these bad boys. A Thrustmaster Ferrari GT Experience 3-in-1 racing wheel, which was on sale for the special price of £39, which was actually less money than it would have cost me, to buy a new DualShock 3 pad for my PlayStation 3. Again, this was another leap of faith purchase, as I had no idea if I'd be able to configure this properly to work with the game. On the plus side though, it was also PlayStation 3 compatible, as well as working on the PC, so even if it didn't work with Daytona USA, it wouldn't have been a complete loss. Now, I mentioned earlier in the video that I'd previously bought a third-party racing wheel for the Dreamcast to try and improve the handling of Daytona USA 2001, but that particular wheel had just turned out to be a big plasticky piece of shite, so I was keeping my expectations tempered as to how good this wheel would play with the original arcade version of Daytona. But holy chuffin heck! Once I'd got all the controls properly configured, this really did feel like I was properly playing the arcade version at home, it was amazing! The steering felt absolutely spot on. The only things missing to really make this feel like a true arcade experience were the fact that the Thrustmaster wheel didn't have a proper four-way gear shifter, instead it relied on paddle shifters underneath the wheel itself. This wasn't really an issue for me back then though, as I hadn't started using manual gears at this point and tended to stick mainly with automatic transmission. The other thing that was missing was the fact that the Thrustmaster wheel didn't support force feedback, a feature that Model 2 emulator supported for certain games. The Thrustmaster wheel though did support something called vibration feedback, which was basically a rumble feature that would happen in place of force feedback effects in certain parts of the game, and for me at the time this was certainly good enough to add to the authentic Daytona experience. Many years later though, I was fortunate enough to inherit a Driving Force GT racing wheel off my brother-in-law when he was getting rid of his PlayStation 3, so I can now play this game with the full force feedback effects working properly. Additionally, once I first started to use manual gears as well, I found it was actually relatively simple to just use the face buttons on the wheel as an alternative to a proper 8 shifter gear stick, which meant that I could easily swap between 1st, 2nd, 3rd and 4th gear at the press of a button. Now not content with giving you a near arcade perfect single player experience, Model 2 emulator lets you link up multiple versions of itself to simulate an arcade network, and it's possible to do this in multiple ways, with multiple different players as well. So in this first example here, I'm playing against a friend on a wireless LAN across two different PCs, using the two different racing wheels that I'd previously spoken about. It's also possible to get multiple versions of the emulator working on one single PC. In this next video I've got four different versions of the emulator running on a single PC in a three player mode against two other friends. All three of us have gone back to the decidedly iffy version of controlling the cars by using joypads here, as there isn't really a practical way I could fit both my steering wheels in front of one screen, and also just to keep things fair between the three of us.
It's even possible to do a combination of multi-PC and single PC multiplayer together. In this next video I'm demonstrating a three player setup with one PC running two linked versions of the emulator using two different screens with the second PC wirelessly linked in as player three. So the Model 2 emulator has actually got two modes of network emulation, both with some drawbacks. The default mode is not synced at all. While this works pretty well, it causes flickering in the cars, which is something you can't have failed to notice in the video here. There is also a version that you can do called Frame Synced, but the problem with this is that it sometimes causes the game to stop for a second or two. A member of the Build Your Own Arcade Controls forum, who goes by the name of Sailor Sat, has created a tool that fixes this flickering issue, but I must admit I've not got round to actually giving it a try myself yet. So whilst the Model 2 emulator version of Daytona USA isn't a home port, I still felt it was significant enough to mention here in this video. Because after the highs and lows of the Saturn and Dreamcast versions of Daytona USA, getting to play an actual proper arcade perfect version of Daytona USA at home, right down to the handling and the multiplayer, really was a dream come true. The original developer of Model 2 Emulator was a Spanish guy by the name of El Semi, and rumour has it that based on the impressive work that he'd done with the emulator, he was then subsequently offered a job at Sega, and then went on to work on the next ports of Daytona USA, which were released in 2011 for the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360. So let's have a look at those versions next. Now, although I do own both of those consoles, I only own the PlayStation 3 version of Daytona USA, so all of the footage in the next segment is going to be exclusively from that version. So as I just mentioned in the last section of the video, in 2011 the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 both got their own ports of Daytona USA, which were available as digital only downloads. Now I think it's fair to say that the announcement of these ports came as somewhat of a surprise to most people, myself included, because just two short years before this in 2009, the original Daytona had made a sort of return to the arcades. Sega Racing Classics was essentially an HD and widescreen port of the original Daytona USA, which was running on the newest Sega arcade board at the time, which was known as the Sega Ringwide. But bizarrely, with all the Daytona USA branding removed, presumably because Sega had lost the license to use it at this point, which made it all the more surprising when it was announced that a proper port of Daytona USA, not Sega Racing Classic, would then be coming to the, at the time, next generation consoles. The Sega Ringwide board was essentially PC based hardware, and just in the last few years, the arcade version of Sega Racing Classic has been made playable on PC through a specific arcade loader crack. I personally have never actually given this hacked version a try. I can't really see the point, seeing as Model 2 emulator already supports HD resolutions, and I've also got an HD console version at home to play as well. And that HD console version is the one that you can see playing in the background here, my PS3 version of Daytona USA. And something else that these home console versions of Daytona USA improve upon compared to the actual original arcade version is the game's draw distance, with the odd bit of pop-up that used to happen in the actual Model 2 board now completely eliminated. Another massive improvement compared to previous home ports of Daytona USA is the fact that these versions were also optimised for people that were playing with pads as well as people using racing wheels. In the video here, I'm just playing the game with a regular PlayStation 3 DualShock 3 pad. And just on the game's default setting, I haven't had to mess around with the X-axis sensitivity at all. It handles absolutely perfect as it is, with no fishtailing or problems with oversteering or anything like that. So for my money, this is definitely the best handling home port of Daytona USA if you are just using a pad. 
Players with racing wheels won't be disappointed either, with all of the game's original arcade force feedback effects being present, and also to me noticeably stronger than they are in Model 2 emulator. If you crank the force feedback effects right up to maximum in this game, it does feel to me like you're almost in danger of losing an arm. Another interesting feature of the PS3 and Xbox 360 versions of Daytona USA was the inclusion of the Rewind mode. The Rewind mode was a feature which was available initially only in a limited supply, which gradually increased the more you played the game. Basically what it allowed was that if you crashed, you could rewind the game back to a point before the crash to still try and get that absolutely perfect lap. This was also quite handy as well if you wanted to practice on a particularly difficult part of the track like this nightmare hairpin that you get at the end of the expert course. In a further bid to increase the longevity of the game, Sega included some extra challenge modes that you could complete, which included certain things like having to reach a certain speed within a certain time limit, or just simply getting to the goal in time. It also saw the return of the Saturn version's karaoke mode. Now I must admit in all honesty, I personally never actually played any of these extra challenges or the karaoke mode, I've just been too busy playing the main game itself. Now one of the other really awesome things about the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 versions of Daytona USA was the fact that they both supported online play, with up to 8 players being able to take part in an online match. Now back when the game very first came out, I did manage to get involved in a few of these 8 player matches and they were absolutely brilliant fun, but sadly though the number of players on the server seemed to dry up very quickly, and pretty soon it got to a point where I was finding maybe only 1 or 2 players online that wanted to race and quickly that number dwindled down to zero. Having said that though, it is actually still possible to play this game online now, seven years after its release date. Just last year I had my video capture equipment out, whilst I was recording some footage of another PlayStation 3 game, when I received an invite to take part in an online game from another one of my YouTube friends. I was quite frankly amazed that this was still possible. Now, as I've never played the Xbox 360 version of this game, I've got absolutely no idea if the same was true on that console. With the numbers of online players slowly starting to dwindle not long after the game was first released. But as the 360 version has just been made Xbox One backwards compatible, it would be interesting to know if online play has suddenly picked up again for Microsoft users. So all in all, the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 versions of Daytona USA are about as close to a perfect port of the game as you can get. A port that manages to enhance the graphics while still maintaining the aesthetic quality of the original game. And a port that handles very well just using a regular joypad. Now if I were to level a couple of criticisms at this game, my first would be this. No local multiplayer. I mean honestly Sega, how difficult would it have been just to have simply added a 4 player split screen mode? Playing online's cool and all, but it's never going to be able to replicate that feeling of fun that you get when you're playing with a big group of mates in the same room. My other criticism would be with the lack of new content in the game, when you think that both the Dreamcast and the Saturn managed to introduce extra stages and extra cars. Now I suspect that that's probably down to the fact that there's a certain amount of emulation magic going on here, rather than the game being a straight port built from the ground up like those other versions were. The game does feature a mirror mode option to play the tracks in, but still, just some new stuff would have been really nice. So the PlayStation 3, Xbox 360 and then later Xbox One ports of the game do represent the last conversions of Daytona USA to home systems. So with that, it's time to look at the game's sequel, pseudo-sequel and its legacy.
Daytona USA's first true sequel came in 1998 in the form of Daytona USA 2 Battle on the Edge. Daytona USA 2 ran on the successor to the Model 2 board, Sega's brand new Model 3 arcade hardware that had debuted two years earlier with the arcade racer Scud Race. Upon its release, the Model 3 board was more powerful than any other arcade platform on the market and was light years ahead of anything that the home console and computer markets could do at the time. This is reflected in the graphics, which you can see are a massive step up from the original Daytona USA that I think could still give a lot of contemporary games a run for their money. Just like the first game, Daytona 2 gave you a choice of three different tracks to choose from, of varying difficulties. The beginner, Astro Waterfall Speedway, the advanced track, Joyopolis 2020 Amusement Park, and the expert stage, Virtuous City. But unlike the original Daytona, it now gave you a selection of three different cars to choose from that varied in the difficulty of their handling, with players that opted to go for the hard level car being rewarded with greater top speed and a greater drifting ability. One notable omission though from the car selection screen was the original Hornet that looked like it had been benched in favour of these three new cars. Anyway, let's have a look at all of these cars and tracks in action, starting with the Chumsgums car, the beginner level car, on the beginner circuit. So much like the original Daytona USA, drifting was the name of the game here. Unlike the first game though, there was much more of an emphasis on using both the brakes and the gears to drift here. Trying to drift using the gears alone would often result in the car spinning out, particularly if you are using the hard level car, the Phantom Full Force. Despite the differences in the handling between Daytona USA 1 and 2, one thing that stayed the same was the rocket start which once again involved keeping your foot fully depressed on the brake whilst trying to keep the tachometer as close to 7 RPMs as possible by partially depressing the accelerator. As soon as the countdown finishes, release the brake, fully depress the accelerator 
and immediately shift up to two whilst trying not to drive into the cars in front of you. There was also a much greater emphasis on drafting in Daytona USA 2, the technique whereby you position yourself behind an opponent's car and take advantage of the decreased wind resistance that you get, increasing your top speed. The game also had some secret functions, such as a time attack mode, an additional four secret views on top of the four regular ones, and also the ability to play the tracks in reverse. There was even an option that let you change the person who sang the songs in the game. Not long after the release of Battle on the Edge, a new and updated version of Daytona USA 2 came out, called Power Edition. Power Edition featured a couple of notable changes from Battle on the Edge, the first being the return of the Hornet as a playable car, complete with its Daytona 1 physics intact. The next biggest change was the beginner stage's environment. In Power Edition, they dropped the biodome of the first game and decided to go for more of a generic NASCAR type track instead. Now, I have got absolutely no idea why they made this change. I don't know if perhaps they wanted to make the game appeal more to the North American market, which is, after all, the home of NASCAR. And perhaps the biodome setting just seemed too fantastical. Perhaps they made the changes to try and make the game seem aesthetically more similar to the first Daytona. Who knows? All I can say is it seems like a real shame, as the biodome is definitely a lot more interesting looking than this track. Not that I've got anything against it, mind you. Something else that changed was the paint job of the Easy Level car, with the sponsors being changed from Chum's Gums to the equally fictitious JC Eagle. Again, I'm not sure why this change was made, but I guess maybe the sight of the two cuddly little bears on the back of the Chum's Gums car just didn't seem manly enough for the NASCAR loving guys in the US. Again, I think this change was a bit of a shame, because I think the Chum's Gums car has just got a little bit more character than the JC Eagle one. Perhaps the biggest change of all, though, was the inclusion of something called the Challenge Mode. The Challenge Mode combined the advanced, expert and beginner stages into one long course that you race through seamlessly with no break in the action. It's a brilliant idea and definitely something that would have added to the longevity factor of this game. As far as a few minor changes go, the game's introduction was slightly different to Battle on the Edge, and the car's handling had also been changed slightly, with some subtle changes in the drift physics between the two games. Now, I've got to admit, playing the two different games, I can't actually tell any difference in how things handle myself, but I definitely think Battle on the Edge has got more aggressive AI, which makes the game a little bit harder than Power Edition. Just like the original Daytona USA, Daytona USA 2 also supported multiplayer, with the difference being this time that this game could actually support a massive multiplayer network of 16 players. Wow! Back in the day though, the biggest amount of Daytona USA 2 cabs that I ever saw linked together was 8. I would be interested to know, dear viewers, if any of you got to enjoy a 16 player setup on this game back in the day. Let me know in the comments. Now, despite being the sequel to one of the most successful arcade racing games of all time, for some strange reason, Daytona USA 2 never ever received a home port. I've previously made another video where I talked in depth about all the possible reasons why this game and certain other Model 3 games never got home ports, so I'm not going to go into detail about that again here. But what I thought has always been especially puzzling is the fact that Sega decided to re-release Daytona USA 1 on the Dreamcast rather than making a port of this game, particularly as Toshihiro Nagoshi was a producer on Daytona USA 2 and design director on Daytona USA 2001. It's also puzzling as well, considering that Daytona USA 2001 had three entirely brand new tracks created for it, that someone at Sega didn't just think, hey, let's just put the Daytona USA 2 tracks in the game instead. Now, despite never getting a home port of its own, the Daytona USA 2 tracks did eventually turn up in another Sega game, with the challenge course from Power Edition appearing as an unlockable bonus in OutRun 2 on the original Xbox. The two games have got very different handling physics, so playing the challenge course in OutRun 2 does feel like a slightly different gameplay experience. But as a tribute to a slice of Sega arcade racing history that never received a home port, it's an incredibly nice touch and a very welcome addition to the game. The challenge course in the Japanese version of OutRun 2 would go on to have further cosmetic improvements to make it even closer to the original arcade version of Power Edition. And just like the regular stages in OutRun 2, the Daytona USA 2 bonus stages were also playable in Xbox System Link multiplayer, with I think a maximum of six people being able to link up their Xboxes. Despite never receiving a home port, Daytona USA 2 did eventually become playable on home computers back in 2011, through the wonders of modern emulation and a specific emulator called Supermodel. 
And this is where all the footage from Battle on the Edge and Power Edition has come from that you've been watching in the video. Since that time, refinements in the emulation have steadily improved, to the point that the game seems to me to be arcade perfect now, complete with false feedback and everything, and much like Model 2 emulator, it actually improves on the original arcade game by adding in an optional widescreen mode and the option to play in HD resolutions. The latest versions of Supermodel have even started to include an experimental network build, allowing you to link up multiple versions of the emulator for multiplayer, although at present this is still work in progress and doesn't run full speed. Now one of the interesting things about arcade ROMs getting dumped and then emulated is that it gives hackers and coders a chance to poke around in the original ROMs code and see if they can find anything interesting. And one such find was that the Hornet Classic was actually included in Battle on the Edge but it just never made the final cut for some reason. We can see here that the version of the Hornet included in Battle on the Edge looks slightly different to the one that was in Power Edition, with an extra hood scoop detail on the bonnet. I should probably just explain for the benefit of any American viewers, bonnet is what we call the hood over here, and has got nothing to do with jaunty Easter hats. And through the magical science of ROM hackery and save states, it is possible to play this version of the Hornet in Battle on the Edge, even if you're a non-coding muggle like me. Whilst it is fully playable, unfortunately this version of the Hornet is broken and will start to decelerate as soon as you start trying to turn left or right. So unfortunately, you're not going to be able to win any races with this one, champ. You'll notice the CPU cars in this are missing most of their bodywork decals. This is owing to the fact I can only run this save state on an older version of Supermodel before things are quite as polished as they are today. Now at the time that I'm recording this, which is late June in 2018, the original Daytona USA is still available to purchase from the PlayStation Network, which using my Sherlock Holmes-like powers of deduction means that Sega must still have the license for the game. Which begs the question then, Sega, why haven't you ported Daytona USA 2 to current systems, you flaming idiots? Despite the fact I have played this game absolutely to death in emulation, I would still happily buy a digital download of this off the PlayStation Network if it meant I could play 16 player network multiplayer. I mean, come on Sega, what have you got to lose? Now despite the massive popularity of Daytona USA and the fact that people still enjoy playing the game today, one of the curious things about it is the fact that Daytona USA 2 is still to this day the only sequel the game's ever received. All of that looked like it might be changing in 2016 though, when this cryptic image appeared online suggesting that a new Daytona was going to appear at the International Association of Amusement Parks and Attractions event of that same year. Were we finally going to be getting Daytona USA 3? No. No, of course we fucking weren't. This is modern day Sega we're talking about. So the game that was initially teased as Daytona USA 3, in fact turned out to be a remake of the original Daytona USA, but with modern day graphics. A game that eventually dropped the 3 from its title and would go on to be known as Daytona Championship USA. So, a modern remake of Daytona USA, huh? What could possibly go wrong? So Daytona Championship USA, what could possibly go wrong? Well turns out, quite a bit actually. When the official Sega press blurbs for the game very first came out, they mentioned that the game would feature three brand new stages, but these three brand new stages simply turned out to be lazy reskins of the original three tracks in mirrored mode. And in fact, now that I think about it, the beginner stage wasn't even mirrored. Pretty much all of the music in the game had been recycled from the Dreamcast version of Daytona USA 2001, and when footage of the game first started to appear online, people were less than impressed with the visual style of the game, with people complaining that it looked more like a first generation PlayStation 3 or Xbox 360 game, rather than a brand new arcade game that was released in 2017. Another criticism levelled at the game was that it simply looked bland and didn't have any of the character of the original Daytona USA. When some playable cabinets started appearing at trade fairs and the like, criticism was also levelled at the controls, with some of these early versions of Daytona having very big dead zones in their steering wheels, meaning the steering was imprecise and to use a technical term, a bit shit generally. 
Another major problem with these early cabinets as well was that they only came with a sequential up and down shifter rather than the four-way eight shifter which the old Daytona USA cabinets used to have, meaning it was impossible to do the advanced drifting techniques such as going from fourth to second and back to fourth again. As fails go, I'm afraid that's a pretty epic one, Sega. This was eventually rectified though, with Sega offering arcade vendors the opportunity to install a four-way gate shifter rather than the up and down sequential one which the cabs came with as a default. But as fails of epic proportions go, we haven't even got onto the biggest doozy of them all yet. We'll come on to that in just a second. Before we do that though, let's actually have a look at the game running properly. We'll have a look at the remastered versions of the original tracks, followed by the reskin mirror mode versions. Single player.
Wait a second, Metro City? Doesn't that mean that this guy is the mayor of this place? Anyway, that's enough Final Fight related shenanigans. Let's get back to this game. Now, I must admit, I was part of that group of people that went from being incredibly excited about the announcement of Daytona USA 3 to rapidly becoming more and more disappointed after finding out it was a remake and then seeing the initial footage online. But having now had the chance to sit down and spend some time with the game, I have revised my opinion somewhat. I think the big, bright, bold, colourful, almost slightly cartoonish graphics suit Daytona USA very well. And most importantly, they retain the sense of speed, keeping that all-important 60 frames a second, which is so crucial to the Daytona experience. And whilst I still think that just simply reusing three of the original tracks in mirror mode and reskinning them was incredibly lazy, particularly as the initial press releases for the game were saying that we were going to be getting three brand new tracks. I do like the aesthetic of the reskin versions, particularly Metro City and Lakeside Castle. I do think it's a shame that they couldn't have done something a little bit more exciting with the reskin of 77 Speedway and simply turning it into a real life version of the Daytona International Speedway track. I mean, how super awesome would it have been to have seen a return of the Biodome from Battle on the Edge? Yeah, yeah, I know if Sega weren't interested in keeping it in Power Edition back in the 1990s, there's even less chance of them doing it now. And that's not to say that I don't like the Daytona International Speedway track, it's just that, you know, it could have been more interesting. Gameplay-wise, as far as I can tell, this handles exactly like the original game, right down to the rocket start even working exactly the same way. With the only real difference I could notice being that you seem to get penalised with much greater loss of speed if you clip a wall or another car. So fortunately those issues that were mentioned with the early beta versions of the game with the massive dead zone seem to have just been an issue with those early display models of the game. As well as the ability to play the game in a quick race, there's also a championship mode where you have to race across three different tracks coming either first, second or third in order to qualify and move on to the next race. There are now five different cars which the player can use when playing the game. With the choice of vehicle and the livery that it's in, being tied to specific tracks. So all in all then, despite my initial reservations, I have actually really enjoyed Daytona Championship USA, despite the fact there is that whiff of lazy half arsedness about the game, which I think is particularly exemplified by the reuse of all the old Daytona USA 2001 music from the Dreamcast. Now I'd mentioned earlier that there was one particularly big epic fail that was associated with this game. A fail so big, so gargantuan, it's almost impossible to believe that it could have ever actually happened in the first place. At the end of 2017, Sega released an update for this game, which was available for arcade vendors to download for free from their website. It turned out that this update contained the entire game, and it wasn't long before a talented group of coders and hackers across a number of different forums across different countries managed to at first get the game to boot in Windows PCs, and then over a period of incremental updates, managed to at first get the controls partially working, if you are using an Xbox 360 pad, to eventually fully working with racing wheels, right down to working false feedback. It's got to the point now that people have even figured out how to get multiplayer working across multiple PCs. Now I still can't quite fully fathom how this was able to happen. I mean, releasing an update for the game, which contains the entire game itself, that was only supposed to be downloaded by arcade vendors, on a public website, must rank as one of the most stupid things I've ever heard. It's like the equivalent of me leaving my car keys on full display on my dashboard, with a note to say, here's my car for Dave to drive, but you can only drive it if you're Dave. I'm 100% certain that none of the other people on this busy street will want to take it out for a test drive. Sega, you absolute muppets. What were you thinking? Still, not that I'm complaining, mind you. I'm yet to encounter an actual Daytona USA Championship arcade cabinet anywhere, so if Sega hadn't released this onto the internet, I probably would have never got a chance to actually play it. I have heard it mentioned as well, that the real money from this game comes from the cabinet sales, rather than the software. So maybe this getting leaked onto the internet isn't really hurting Sega that much. The cabinets themselves feature something called a spectator video billboard marquee, and have cameras that film the players as they're playing the game, showing their reactions in-game. The game also features a party mode, which is designed to give operators the ability to pre-program private events, and run them right from the game. Well, I think that pretty much comprehensively covers everything to do with Daytona Championship USA. We're in the home stretch now, so let's move on to the final part of the video, which is looking at Daytona USA's legacy.
So in some respects, we have already been talking about Daytona USA's legacy. From the modern remake, Daytona Championship USA, the sort of re-release of Daytona USA in the arcades before this, Sega Racing Classics, the two proper numbered sequels, Battle on the Edge and Power Edition, all the various home ports and expansions of the original game, and then of course not forgetting about the fact that despite never getting a home port of its own, the Daytona 2 Power Edition tracks eventually appeared in the Xbox port of OutRun 2. But what other media and games has Daytona USA had an influence on? And which games have referenced it directly? Let's step back in time now. Back to the mid-1990s in the era of the Sega Saturn. And what must rank as one of the most bizarre cameos ever for the Daytona Hornet in a computer game? Ladies and gentlemen, I give you... Fighters Mega Mix. Fighters Mega Mix was one of the Saturn's swan song games. It was a fighting game created by Sega AM2 that combined all of the characters from their two previous games, Virtua Fighter and Fighting Vipers, as well as a host of characters from a whole load of other Sega games, with the last unlockable character being the Hornet from Daytona USA. So now you can witness the absolute weirdness of seeing Sarah from Virtua Fighter beating up the Hornet. Now, although I did used to own this for the Saturn back in the day, much like my copy of Daytona USA CCE, I sold this many, many years ago, so I'm relying on an emulator to play it here. So in the version that I'm playing here using SSF emulator, there is unfortunately no sound, and most of the sound effects aren't working as well, but funnily enough, the Hornet's engine sounds are one of the few sound effects that do work. Unlike Virtua Fighter, the characters in Fighting Vipers wore armour, which would slowly take damage the more hits they took. If they took enough, it would smash off altogether. And the Hornet does play like a Fighting Vipers character, so its outer chassis is like its armour. You can choose to get rid of the armour yourself though, and doing this suddenly gives the Hornet a whole load of extra moves, although it does make it more vulnerable to damage from the other players. So yeah, the game really is batshit crazy. There's nothing more surreal than the sight of the automatic Hornet beating up the manual transmission Hornet. Oh, there we go. As I'm sure you probably noticed, the Hornet stage is based on 777 Speedway. It even has the King of Speed as its background theme. The music that normally plays on the beginner stage in Daytona USA. Anywho, that's enough time spent with Pfizer's Mega Mix. Let's move on to our next game. The next appearance of the Hornet was in the 2012 kart racing game Sonic and All-Star Racing Transformed, and it was created by Sumo Digital, the guys behind the excellent Xbox port of OutRun 2 and all the other home conversions of OutRun Coast to Coast. Sonic Transformed was initially released on the PS3 and the Xbox 360, before later receiving a PC port as well. I initially started off with the PS3 version of the game, before moving on to the PC version after I found out it supported 60 frames a second because, you know, me and frame rates. The transform mechanic worked in such a way that each player had a land-based mode, a flying mode, and an aquatic mode. 
and the Hornet was no exception, with its flying form being represented by an F-14 from the old Sega arcade game Afterburner, and its aquatic form looking like a hydrofoil boat that resembled a Dreamcast controller. As homages go to old Sega games, I think this is a lovely touch. Collectively, the three combined forms were known as the character Ages. Cause you see, it's it's, it's Sega backwards, isn't it? It's the Sega backwards. <laughs> Characters were unlocked in the game by gaining stars for completing missions as you played through it. And Ages was the very last character to be unlocked, because Sega and Sumo Digital love to torture me. Despite the game's very child-friendly appearance, don't be fooled. The game was rock hard on some of the later difficulty settings, and unfortunately you did have to go through those in order to actually access this character. I say unfortunately, but that's really just me being a whingy old man. I bet some of you young scallywags absolutely love the challenge. But for me, as much as I love the game, and I do truly love this game, every time one of those cheating CPU bastards shot me from behind as I desperately tried to claw enough stars together to unlock this character, I'm amazed that my PlayStation 3 pad didn't end up embedded in the TV screen. Fortunately, once I got the PC version, I didn't need to go through all that torture all over again, because I unlocked the characters via other means. Now years ago, I did hear a rumour over on the official Sega forums that there was talk originally in the game's development of putting a Daytona USA track in here. Now, I don't know if that's just hearsay or if there's any factual basis behind it at all, but it's a real shame they didn't. How cool would that have been? A Sonic and All-Stars version of 37 Speedway and all the other Daytona tracks. Well, guess we can dream. Now, whilst we're still on the subject of Sonic and All-Star Transformed and Daytona USA Legacy, in an example of virtual life imitating virtual art, I noticed a while ago when I was watching the film Wreck-It Ralph that one of the arcade machines in the back of the arcade has got the Daytona Hornet on its marquee. It's got a different name, but it's still definitely the Hornet. And the reason that this is all connected is because of the fact that Wreck-It Ralph himself was a guest character in Sonic and All-Stars Transformed. Sonic and All-Star Transformed is definitely one of my favourite games of the previous generation of consoles, and it's well worth checking out if you've never played it, particularly if you're a fan of old school Sega games. It's got an absolutely wicked soundtrack as well. The next guest appearance of the Hornet in another game was an incredibly surprising one. It was available as a DLC car for the PlayStation Vita version of Ridge Racer. Together with a DLC song that you can purchase to go with it, which is called Ridge Racer USA Mix, sung by none other than the legend that is Takanubo Mitsuyoshi, which sounds like a mashup of Let's Go Away from the original Daytona USA and the tune Ridge Racer from the first Ridge Racer game. It's kind of awesome in a surreal meta sort of way. Now, I don't actually own a PlayStation Vita, so I've never actually got to play this game. And I was under the impression that this particular DLC was Japan only. But out of curiosity, I just had a quick look on the EU PSN, and both the car and the song are available to buy over here. Now, in some ways, for me at any rate, seeing the Hornet cameoing in a Ridge Racer game is almost weirder than seeing it beat itself up in Fighters Mega Mix. Bearing in mind what bitter rivals Sega and Namco were back in the 1990s, and the fact that the Ridge Racer series was one of the main competitors for most of Sega's arcade races. But I guess in this day and age when you've got Sonic and Mario starring in games together, Sarah from Virtua Fighter making a guest appearance in Dead or Alive, Akuma from Street Fighter guest starring in Tekken, it probably isn't that weird after all. So these are all of the appearances of the Hornet in other media that I'm aware of. Do you know of any more? Let me know in the comments below. And when we're talking about Daytona USA's legacy, it's hard not to see its influence in a lot of other games that have come after it. Particularly games like Sega's own Scud Race, which is often described as a spiritual sequel to Daytona USA. Or Sega and <coughs> cough, Electronic Arts coughs, later returned to the world of arcade stock car racing with Sega NASCAR Arcade, a game which is a bit of a poor relation of Daytona USA's in my opinion. But hey, at least they've got a rolling start in there. There was even a Kickstarter started by someone to create a 90s style arcade racer, which looked like the most beautiful love letter to Sega games of old. 
Sadly though, the developer Nickel Arse got involved with it, and it now looks like it's turned into vaporware. Nickel Arse, if you're watching this, you still owe me £20, you bastard <laughs> wankers. Maybe the game will still see the light of day eventually, but considering the Kickstarter was started in 2013, I'm not holding out any hope for it. Which is such a shame, because the game looks absolutely gorgeous. When that initial announcement about Daytona USA 3 first went out, this was the sort of thing I was hoping we were going to get. Let's just take a moment now to kick back and see what could have been. Now hold on just a tire screech in second here. Literally just as I was about to start uploading this, a little voice suddenly popped up in my brain, reminding me that I'd been caught out by third party match content strikes on YouTube before from unexpected sources. And it suddenly occurred to me that all the music in these videos could potentially be a source of a third party strike, even though I don't think it's been commercially used anywhere apart from in this game, which has never been released. So just to be on the safe side, I'm going to use a bit of music from some old Sega classics here. If you want to see these working with the sound effects and the correct music, then use the links in the description. Anyway, enough talk, let's crack on.
I just don't get it. If you've got a game that looks this complete and this gorgeous, why would you just sit on it and do absolutely fuck all with it? I mean, nickel arse. If you're not going to do anything with it, why don't you sell it to a developer that will? Like, I don't know, Sega. Now, if you can remember that far back, because I have been talking for a very long time, I mentioned right at the start of the video that Daytona USA still frequently pops up, and lists of the best arcade games ever, and the most influential driving games of all time. And it's not just games magazines and gaming websites that have taken notice. Even the mainstream media are writing articles about Daytona USA's enduring appeal, and just why it remains so popular and so influential after 25 years. And if you're someone who previously wasn't all that familiar with the game, and you've made it all the way to the end of the video, now hopefully you'll have more of an idea why this is the case too. And if you're someone who was already a big fan of Daytona USA, then hopefully I might have been able to reveal a Daytona factoid or two that you weren't previously aware of. I really hadn't planned for this project to be quite so gargantuan in length as it's turned out to be, but hey, Sometimes shit happens and you've just got to go with it. So once again, if you've made it all the way to the end of the video, then thank you so much for sharing in 25 years of Daytona USA with me. I hope you've enjoyed it. You're obviously a YouTuber of great discerning taste and are no doubt very handsome as well. So just remember I said that when it comes to hitting that there old like button. And with that, as we approach the final corner with the finish line dead ahead, all that remains now is for me to say I've been Mr. Thunderwing, thank you for watching, and goodbye. But hey, don't be a stranger. Come on by any time. Hello, kids. It's TV's Admiral Akbar here. If you like this video, then make sure to like, share and subscribe. Why not check out some more of Mr. Thundering's Sega-related videos? It's not a trap! Ho ho ho!